Today we have bum, ba, da, bum, Adam Jones, uh, uh, who is a Canadian filmmaker and screen screenwriter of Cree and Métis ancestry. Adam is the writer and director of Fire Song. Like what? This film was amazing. Their feature film debut um, was premiered at the 2015 Toronto International Film Festival and went on to pick up Audience Choice Awards at four <clears throat> film festivals, including the Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival. In 2018, they published um, their first young adult novel, which is an adaptation of Fire Song. The novel was a finalist in the BERT Award for First Nations Inuit Métis Literature in 2019. The novelization of Fire Song was chosen for the Bronze Medalist for Young Adult Fiction at the Independent Publisher Book Awards. So let's give it up for Adam. That's incredible, right? <laughs> and we also have Elder Albert McLeod, who is a well-respected two-spirit <clears throat> elder, knowledge keeper, and fierce advocate for two-spirited, non-binary, and LGB LGBTQ2 plus uh, folks. <laughs> elder McLeod has received an honor honorary uh, doctor of laws from the University of Winnipeg and is recognized for their work in HIV education and providing guidance, education, and support for many folks across Turtle Island. So we are super proud to have Elder Albert McLeod with us. So give it up. <laughs> and furthering our panel, we also have Autumn LaRose Smith who is a proud queer and Métis student who attends Saskatchewan Urban Native Teachers Education Program in Saskatoon. Autumn is a former We Matter Ambassador of Hope and is currently our Programs and Outreach Administrator for We Matter. So we're super honored to have Autumn with us today. And last but never least, uh, we have Scott Wabano. <laughs> Born and raised in Moose Cree First Nation territory with roots back um, to the Cree Nation of, um, and I so apologize, Scott, if I get this wrong, um, Wascaganish, lo located in the Eustish, geez, Louise, Eustish, actually, Scott, turn your mic on, T tell the kids, how do you say it? <laughs> uh, the Cree Nation of Wiskagnish from the EUST region. Thank you so <laughs> much. Uh, Scott is a two-spirit fashion stylist, designer, artist, advocate, and social media content creator. Amongst their dedication to fashion, Scott uh, loves to use their voice and platform to bring authentic on Indigenous representation while creating safe spaces for two-spirit and Digicree and BIPOC youth within industries they work in. Scott currently resides in Dish with the One Spoon Treaty 13 Terry, which we know as Toronto. So let's give a big round of applause for our panelists this evening. Woo <laughs> <laughs> we love it and we love to see you all here. I'm so honored to be moderating this panel full of inspiring youth, and I'm just so excited. <clears throat> so we are going to move into our questions for this evening. <coughs> so question number one is for Adam. So thank you for being here, first and foremost. Um, we can all, if, you know what, let's give it up for Adam. Use your um, applause reactions, or unless you want to turn your mics on, because this film is so impactful. So let's hear it. Let's hear it for Adam. Incredible. 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 
Thank you. I could not be more honored to do this. And if it wasn't for Adam, I wouldn't be doing this. And I'm so thankful. Like this film, so moving. Thank you. So Fire Song touches on the topics of Indigenous community, Indigenous youth identity, overcoming challenges. So Adam, we would love to hear more about the heart that went into this film. Why did you choose to share this story? Why was it important to cover the topics you did in the film? Um, oh man, there's so much There's so much to talk about. I mean, I, I, first of all, I just wanna say thank you so much for having me here and um, to really just acknowledge how far we've come. I, like, I, I know that the film is not that old, but at the same time, like when I started writing Fire Song, I think I was probably like 22, 23, and I'm going to turn 40 <laughs> in January. And, you, you know, like it's, it's like, a, it's, it's just a really long journey. And when I first started coming out and I remember, you know, having my first sexual experiences and 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 meeting other young two-spirit people like I, I just I remember meeting this this one guy and, and I say meeting like we hooked up or whatever and, and he was just like he was like seriously really blown away because he just he had never met anybody who is queer and indigenous before like he just thought he was he legitimately thought he was the only one and um he had like it was the first conversation he'd ever been able to have with somebody who shared that identity with him and and so when you know when i was first writing fire song it came from a super a super personal place you know for for myself being somebody who you know, when I was growing up, felt a lot of, um, you know, uh, isolation and had my own experiences with with um, suicide and extreme depression that were, you know, really an ongoing theme in my life. But, you know, it's, it's, I knew when I started writing it, that it's, it's hard to get a feature film made and it's you know it's hard to it's a hard road to be a, a writer and director and I knew that I would need something I need to write about something that was important to me as a person and something that that, that I cared about but that was also you know kind of beyond myself because I knew that it would challenge me in ways that would kind of break me down and make me want to give up and um, so it had to be a story that felt like it was for for me and my career and, and whatever, all that stuff um, that you that you need to think about as as a as a young artist trying to make your way, but also like for for other people. That, so that, that when I wanted to quit, I couldn't quit because I knew that it was about uh, other people. So when I I started writing the film and thinking about the film, I mean, I was thinking my, about my own um, experiences when I was growing up, but I was also thinking about. Um, people that that I knew I think especially like when I moved to Toronto at first and was I was working at um, Native Child and Family Services in, in the youth department and so I just met a lot of um, other young people um, some two-spirit youth but but not not only two-spirit youth who, who are coming from um, isolated communities um, all over the country but especially in Ontario um, who are coming into the city for their first time and really like that experience of feeling like like, like they're running from something, um, running from some truth, uh, something hard in their community, was something that that a lot of those youth that I was that I was working with um, had in common, and so there was this like this push and pull that the two spirit youth in particular felt between like needing to be in the city and needing to be in the city to explore who we are and who we wanted to become and, and try on these different kinds of identities that, that, we're, that we're awakening to, but also needing to be in our own communities and close to our families just as badly. And so to, to me, like that was the heart of the story. That was the thing that drove me is, you know, 
for, for myself and trying to understand where my own um, feelings of isolation and depression came from and wanting to tell that story, but not wanting to tell a story about breaking away from your family and your community and, and that being the answer because that to me felt like a lie you know you don't that's that's a story that we've seen and heard a million times in a million different kinds of stories in in from you know mostly western storytellers where there's a, a, a usually a young person usually a queer person um, who needs to cut themselves off from their families and move to the city in order to um, find who they are, discover who they are, and, and, and ultimately become who they are. And, and for me, that wasn't true. And I, and for so many of the, the youth that I was, that I was working with and friends that I had and people that I was seeing in the community, I just knew that that wasn't true for us. And so I wanted to tell that story and to say that, you know, to tell that story of, of being torn between those two realities of needing to be in two different places at once and to explore different side of, sides of ourselves and, and, and the importance of holding on to all of that um, together. And um, anyway, yeah, that was, that, was what, um, that was what brought me through. But since, since starting to write the film and then, you know, making the movie and seeing, seeing where everyone has come since making the film, like that cast mm -hmm. is so gay. <laughs> and they weren't you, you know they, they weren't they were not all out when we were making the movie um but like, so many, and not not just the cast like people mm -hmm. people like behind the scenes like it's like it like became a very very uh lgbtq to spirit group and i and i think that the the experience of being on fire song um helped them to to you know, make connections with other two-spirit people and, and find their way. Like, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if anybody has seen uh, Querencia is a, a web series um, that's uh, just launched on APTN, uh, I think in June this year, but Mary Galloway, who plays Tara in Fire Song, she's the like writer, director, lead performer. It's a very, wow. you know, two-spirit um, urban Vancouver story. Wow. Um, now, in, in, in my story is that I've kind of like gone away from from working as a writer and director, and, and now I, I work as the um, what is my title uh, <laughs> director <laughs> director of TV content for for APTN, and I've I've been there for a handful of months. But you know, for like really, there's so many exciting two spirit stories that are coming, yeah, and and not not just because people are. I don't know, like a, 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 a awakening to, to, to our stories, but just like there's so much power in the community now that there wasn't two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. Um, and and the, the voices that are there are so strong. Like I'm going to a premiere of a new Two-Spirit film called Wildhood, which is just going to blow you all away. It's so gorgeous. It's a two-spirit Mi'kmaq film uh, that's premiering at the Toronto International Film Festival tomorrow, and it's just oh. going to make me cry and <laughs> laugh. And it's so gorgeous, and it's been and, and it was and it was supported financially. You know, I think okay. that that's the I'm rambling now, but that that's a big part of the story of Fire Song too. Is that um, you know when I started writing it, and I I had you know like as I was in in Toronto, like the the, the center of the, the the film industry in, in Canada, yeah. and I had experience writing on um, different shows, and I had had films that had like traveled around to the places that they're supposed to go to um, yeah. as a as a filmmaker in order to to build a track record. But because I wanted to tell a two spirit story, and even though like the script had won awards before the movie was produced. Um, the industry really didn't want to give any money to the film to get it to help it get made um so we really had almost nothing to work with when it came to getting yeah. the film produced but yeah. now just a handful of years later you're seeing you know like two spirit films two spirit stories being told on like a high level with a lot of support behind them and i yeah. It, like it, it could not make me any happier just to just see those storytellers 
to see those stories being lifted up and celebrated yeah. in that way. So that's all right. I'll end, I'll end it there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. And that is a brilliant response to our question. And I'm so thankful that we have your input. And um, again, this film is super amazing. So thank you so much for sharing this time with us and giving your input because it is incredible. I'm sure a lot of us will give the props 100%. Uh, so thank you so much, Adam. Thank you. For some youth, uh, just as it was for Shane in the film, it can be challenging to accept ourselves and our identity. We know that so many Indigenous youth might struggle with this. So what are some gifts that you see in two-spirited and LGBTQ2 plus youth that you can empower them on their journeys of self-discovery? Yeah, I think uh, what's Im important in the film was, you know, for the couple, I think it's Shane and David, that's the name. You got it. For Shane and David, that, um, despite all the sort of challenges and barriers to their relationship, which is, you know, about nurturing and love, they still came together. They still supported the, the, each other, uh, even not knowing, you know, the future, that sort of, that sort of very basic uh, level of uh, nurturing and um, unconditional support and intimacy within the context of the community that sometimes feels very violent or very narrow-minded, that despite how they navigated each situation, each challenge, they came back together and they did spend time together where they were in love and expressing love. And that's the important piece, you know, regardless of your gender identity or sexual orientation, I think that's key for those steps of coming out of that sort of situation of, uh, you know, not having adults that you can model after or, or people stuck in their own trauma and crisis. And that, that through the film, that thread is con continuous, that it happens in their community, right? They don't leave the community, they're still there and how over time that evolves, right? They find supportive people like uh, Shane's mother and David's grandmother, and, and that sort of becomes a pathway of understanding and validation of, you know, they don't have to explain their love for each other to get it validated. They, they present it and accept it and it's understood. And, you know, with the sort of the moving away from home piece, you know, it's kind of like, well, we're abandoning our, our dysfunctional community. But that's, I don't think that's the real story. I think it is, youth need to explore the world and it's okay, right? It's our right, you know, to go to university, to have a career, right? To go to Toronto, to go to New York, go to San Francisco. There's nothing wrong with that, right? And, and knowing that, you know, and I like to see it with the golden rods and the wild rice is, uh, and how that's woven into the film, it's more that permanence of that community, right? That, that sort of the, the sort of uh, environmental part uh, and the water, right? That, that is their, their traditional territory. And, and for myself, you know, I'm 66 and I, I still go home to the paw. I have to invite myself. <laughs> like nobody invites me, but that's part of that legacy of lateral violence, right? Where, where you do not truly express that sort of uh, healthy emotions of nurturing and love, right? Because it's too much of a risk, even today, right? So we're always guarded. We're always sort of, uh, you know, testing the water in our relationships and also less likely to commit, and so I feel that for myself, you know, I, I left uh, the PAW when I was 19 from a similar situation where people didn't have the knowledge and the skills to even talk about sexuality, let alone being gay. And I just knew I, I had to leave. But I've been able to come full circle, right? So I live in the city, but I go home and, and I'm part of 
that northern culture because that that is where I was raised. So so that's kind of what I felt is that, uh, you know, and a lot of the anxiety or trauma that the youth were experiencing was was not their own, right? They were reacting to a context of, you know, unknown causes of, you know, anxiety or fear or depression. And so so they were being affected by it, but it, what didn't belong to them. That's what I feel. It doesn't belong to them. And, and you know, where at the end, the adults do step up, like uh, Shane's mother and uh, the grandmother do say, you know, uh, you know, that they are supportive. So, so I felt that 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 was and that they weren't running from home, they were facing a future together which I felt was, you know, and, and I think that's important. Like, you know, my generation, a lot of uh, gay people were single because it was hard to be out. It was hard, you know, you couldn't get married. We didn't have same-sex marriage. And nowadays, you know, we have a younger generation who can have a partner, you know, can have security, you know, they can buy a house. And so it, it generationally, uh, the, the experience has shifted and changed, right? Uh, and that, you know, um, you know, having those social supports and intimate supports of having a partner is, is something, uh, you know, that is really about living uh, a life there. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh... <clears throat> insight with us very appreciated <clears throat> i'm sure a lot of us can uh connect with what you have said and so i'm very grateful for you to share the insight with us thank you albert in the films we saw examples of lateral violence such as bullying which is an example of what uh we experience sometimes in our own communities what can you share with uh with us of what lateral violence is to you and how we can move from lateral violence to lateral love. Awesome, thank you so much. And sorry for cutting out there. Can everyone hear me okay? I can hear you very well, Mama. Awesome, okay, lateral violence. When, I, uh, when Chelsea sent me this question, I thought I had an idea of what lateral violence was um peer-to-peer -peer violence and violence within the communities and then when I googled the definition I was really shocked to see that um and I didn't know this that lateral violence um specifically uh talks or it talks about uh, violence within specifically minority communities and um indigenous communities it, it seemed to be almost like it was just something that was made for indigenous communities in a way that like when I researched it, uh, it only ever referenced Indigenous communities specifically experiencing lateral violence. And um, that just kind of surprised me. I thought it was <laughs> more of uh, a well-known term. And I, and I hate to see that this is a term that's associated with in Indigenous communities. And, and I think that we all have the power to, to change that, especially everyone here, like you said earlier, John, um, everyone here watching this film and, and at this panel is, is are people who are wanting to make change and are already change makers in their community. And I, and I think to put it in, in a context that we are all way too familiar with is um, thinking of lateral violence as a, a pandemic disease, right? It's, um, it affects, it spreads and it spreads and affects um, everybody, even if the, you might not be on specifically the receiving end of uh, uh, lateral violence, you're still affected by it. And I saw it in the movie, I, I, I took like direct quotes so there's one part where um, really, really quickly, uh, I heard Albert's sister got, a, got your mom's job. She said she sucks at it. It was so quick. It was just like a, a little snippet line. And I, and I think the movie portrayed how lateral violence seems so harmless in the moment. Um, and, and people would laugh it off and, you know, just kind of like make a quick joke, but it, it, it piles on you, right? Um, there's a workshop that I saw regarding lateral violence before. And, um, the youth were putting rocks. Every time someone said something bad, they were putting rocks in somebody's backpack. And by the end of the line, when they talked to all the people, their backpack was really, really heavy with, ro with rocks. And then they went again. And so everybody complimented or said a nice thing to that youth. And as they did that, they actually took rocks out of the backpack. And by the end of the line, that youth had uh, an empty backpack. Their backpack was really, really light. They weren't drugging that, judging that around. And that's kind of how I consider lateral violence to be. 
La Real Love. And I think um, one of the reasons why that I, why I love We Matter so much is because I really think that uh, We Matter kind of embodies and is the definition of lateral love. Um, you know, we are spreading, doing our work to spread messages of, of hope uh, and culture and healing and love and, and positive messages for youth. Um, so I think, you know, seeing how easy it was to spe spread lateral violence within the community and within the movie, right? Someone just said something really quick, everybody laughed and everybody went on their way. And by the end of the movie, you could kind of see people like sticking up for each other a little bit more, or calling each other out. Um, it can be easy, just as easy as that. Um, when you're in a situation where there's lateral violence going on, or maybe you're the product of just um, ignoring it, because we all know that people are bringing other people down. It, it, yeah. they're, they're not in a, in a healthy place, right? So just not letting that weigh on you and, and stop spreading the, those messages stop spreading the messages of hate. It's as easy as if you were to go on Facebook and you see someone dragging someone down, don't like that post, right? Don't share that post, but instead yeah. you can counter it, say for every message of hate or lateral violence that you see spreading on your, your social media, how about instead share a message of positivity to counter mm -hmm. that? And so that's like a little way that people can spread lateral love and almost like balance that out. And eventually it's not gonna balance it out. There's gonna be more messages of lateral love instead of messages of lateral violence. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that insight. We really appreciate it, Autumn. Give it up for Autumn, y'all. Snaps, heart. <laughs> Thank you, Autumn. <clears throat> All right, so uh, next question. Scott, lovely Scott. Indigenous youth uh, have so many gifts, which we all know, um, like the character in the movie and the youth who are sitting in front of us today. Um, Scott, what are some ways you have used your gifts to feel hope and change in your community or in the space that you are currently existing in? Uh, thank you for having me. I just want to apologize ahead of time because they're doing laundry right now, so you might hear the washer like in the background. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like uh, when you told, when I was given this question, you know, it took me um, kind of a while to figure out, you know, what my gifts actually were. I don't know. I feel like as an artist, we kind of are, we think of ourselves that way. We're like, oh, we're not that gifted. But I don't know. But it, I had like took some uh, time to like, you know, reflect on it. And then, you know, I like realized that I honestly think just being an Indigenous youth uh, being an indigenous queer youth, a two-spirit youth right now is honestly the biggest gift of all, you know, and just using my voice to allow others to kind of tap into their own inner power and, you know, find their own inner gifts, which we all have to, you know, help be that change within their communities. I think that's also a gift, you know, um, allowing others to find themselves and to kind of have their own definition of living, you know, their own definition of Indigenous queer, their own definition of two spirit, and that's something that I loved about uh, that we matter did too as well in the past was providing their own two spirit dictionary and allowing, um, you know, other indigenous youth to kind of reclaim that um, term and kind of define it for themselves. Um, you know, it's really beautiful. You know, even just being myself sometimes I feel like is a gift. Um, you know, people do come and, you know, share messages, share really nice words about how, you know, and I feel like that with myself as well, too, when I see other people uh, living confidently and, you know, unapologetically and authentically that I feel like that allows me to also be, you know, confident within myself and to be who I am, you know, kind of as, as a source of inspiration. And, just touching base on what Adam was saying, you know, this movie really touched, um, what I really loved about this movie was that, you know, we didn't have to kind of, you know, cut our family away. Like we, sh this movie does show that as uh, Indigenous queer, two-spirit people, not LGBTQ, we, um, you know, our family is our community and, you know, this movie and also my journey, my personal journey, is kind of letting youth know that they too can live in kind of both worlds, you know, living within their community, within their family setting, uh, within their 
ceremonies within their traditions, their culture, um, but also being in Toronto, a big, you know, um, a really diverse place, you know, that's kind of like a concrete jungle. And, you know, I feel like a lot of youth do get intimidated on moving to big cities like that because they feel like they have to, you know, sacrifice a part of themselves or a part of their identity to kind of live in, um, in a city like Toronto. But, you know, just, but just being myself, you know, and letting youth know that they don't need to sacrifice them, any parts of themselves to um, be who they are. So I think just more Indigenous youth and Two-Spirit youth just living their lives, um, you know, authentically and just paving those ways and creating those safe spaces, you know, um, like for myself within the fashion industry and, you know, uh, ensuring that Two-Spirit youth could walk into a room and not feel like they don't belong, you know, and also providing that representation that I personally never seen growing up. You know, I never seen Two-Spirit Youth in a fashion campaign. I never seen Two-Spirit Youth in a beauty campaign. I never seen a Two-Spirit film like this. So just, you know, uplifting these voices, you know, creating safe spaces, encouraging others to be, you know, themselves authentically and unapologetically, I think, um, that's kind of my gift that I've been using to kind of feel hope, not only for my communities, but all communities across the nation, across the world. Thank you so much, Scott, for that insight. <clears throat> it is so refreshing to hear um, from you that uh, narrative where um, a lot of true spirit folk can, uh, may not have seen themselves in the past, but now through the work of yourself and a lot of other folks that they can feel inspired and see themselves and really take it on. So everyone on the call, if we can give Scott the props where they are due, I mean, <laughs> I mean, God is killing it, right? And so the work that Scott does, <laughs> even for me, and I'm older than Scott, I'm saying how by much, kidding. <laughs> it inspires me and it allows me to feel included within an industry where I never believed that I could be. So Scott, thank you. We really appreciate it. Love you. <laughs> so we have a question for Chelsea. Before and before we move into this question, I want to let everyone know on the call that um, after this question, we are opening it up for just question and answer from the audience. So if you have questions. Um, throw it in the chat and it will be funnel to me. Um, I, we may not be able to get to every question, but uh, send them away, please, please, please. So this question is for Chelsea and why we are all here today is Suicide Prevention Day, uh, but for Indigenous youth. Um, Suicide Prevention Day is not a start, neither is it um, an end, which some of us really, truly know. <clears throat> so Chelsea, uh, can you share some ways um, that you incorporate life promotion into your everyday life and that may be helpful to other Indigenous, indigenous youth who are on the call today? For sure. Um, so I'm kind of jumping in here because Shayla had to go really quickly because of an emergency, unfortunately. Yes, um, I wish her we... well, and we're so thankful for Chelsea. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> um, we thought this question was super, super important to cover because it really kind of brings everything together and, you know, helps us think about life promotion as a whole, understanding what it is, as well as, you know, like how we can actually put those things into action in our life. Um, I 
was not planning on being on screen today. I was planning on doing things in the background and supporting the event. I literally like drove for 12 hours today and like packed a U-Haul. So this is why I look like this, but I'm showing up in all of this greatness. Um, <laughs> I am one of the directors at We Matter. I'm the director of programs and youth engagement. And I'm really, really, really honored and blessed to be able to do this work and work with Indigenous youth across the country, particularly around the topic of life promotion. To me, life promotion means that we can create a space where Indigenous youth can see a life for themselves. We see so often in community and just within the world that certain lives are valued more than others. And in order to, you know, create those spaces so that others, that lives in general across the board are valued and focused on, um, we need to create those spaces. And it's important for us to be able to promote life um, so that people can see that they have a life for themselves, that they can see that they have gifts that they can bring to the table. They see people succeeding that look just like them um, because we end that they can heal. And I think that life promotion really encompass, encompasses a lot of those things. It can look like a lot of different things. It can look like preventative work. Um, so like suicide prevention. It can also look like a lot of tackling socioeconomic issues. And it can also look like, you know, uplifting people and supporting some of the things that are important to us like finding passion and joy in our lives, finding balance between mind, body, spirit, and emotion, finding, you know, uplifting our friends and our loved ones and talking about the importance of mental health and finding balance. So, you know, it encompasses a lot, but, and it can be a lot of work, but each of us has our own gifts. And this is kind of, you know, why we asked Scott that question about gifts too, right? Because we each have our own gifts and the way we bring those gifts to the table helps us each promote life in our own unique way. And when we bring all of those gifts together in community, that's when we can really see a life forward for all of us, which I think is really beautiful. So for me, you know, there's lots of different everyday ways that we can go about it. Um, if I think about, I kind of think about it in different scales. So if I think about it on the, what is it called? There's intrapersonal and interpersonal. Intrapersonal is like within yourself. So how can I promote life for myself? How can I, you know, change that mindset for myself so that I see that I am valued, that I value myself and I see that I'm worthy that I can process how I'm feeling, mind, body, spirit, and emotions so that I can be in a good place. What are the, you know, I know we always talk about self-care, but it is important. So what are those things I can do to take care of myself? Even if those things are the hard things that I don't want to do. And then there's the interpersonal. So between my friends and my loved ones and my family, what can I do on that interpersonal connection in order to uplift and show the loved ones in my life that they matter. So how can I, you know, share those affirmations with my friends, help them celebrate their gifts, where they, if they feel like they need support, what are the ways that I can offer my gifts so that they can uplift their gifts or that they can access the supports in their life? And then there's, okay, so now I have to think about it. <laughs> And then we go out a little bit more to like community and stuff, right? So, and this could be like community, this could be nation. There's lots of different ways to identify community. Um, this could be, you know, across the country. This could be in your specific region, your province. There's lots of ways to think about it. Um, but in that sense, you know, what does this region need? <laughs> or what does this, community need. We all know that, you know, there's over 600 Indigenous communities across the country of so-called Canada. So in that sense, you know, that's a lot of different situations and cultures and things happening. One thing we've learned about in We Matter is that 
you know, we'll talk to one youth from one community and what they need in that community is totally different than another. And the gifts that they can offer in that community, you know, could really complement another community as well. And that community, those gifts in that community could complement another community. So what are the needs for life promotion within one community to the next? And what are the gifts that exist within those communities that we can highlight and build upon to help, you know, demonstrate those strengths so that we can see that we have something to offer and really help our communities grow and flourish. And I know that's on, that one's a little bit less like super practical and like a little bit more like, you know, <laughs> ideas kind of big picture. Um, but hopefully it kind of makes sense. And then there's the world or like really broad, right? So in that sense too, what is the change you want to make in the world? And you can think about it from what you can do and you can think about it as like, what are the gaps that you see? So, you know, if there's a gap that you see and you see that there's something that you could do to fill it, no matter how small, that's helping towards life promotion. Anything that's going to help people see that they have a vision and a path in this world helps towards life promotion. So I just wanted to thank everybody for joining and for listening. And I'll pass it back to John um, to move on to the Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for that answer. We really appreciate it. <clears throat> so as I've said before, uh, we asked a question. Oh. <laughs> before we ask Chelsea that question, um, we're going to open it up to the audience. So if the audience has any questions, this is the time to ask for any of our panelists. We have about 10 minutes, so feel free to ask. I will be keeping an eye on it. <coughs> so our panelists are Adam, Bont, uh, Adam, Elder Albert, and uh, Chelsea or any questions that you may have. So let us know. This event has been um, very moving. I saw the film a while back and seeing the film today, it's still so impactful. As um, for any folks who may have seen the film a while back, I'm sure you can agree. The film is quite well thought out and well, produced so um can can i yes of course. I, don't, I don't know if we have questions yet um okay. but just on on the idea of um just on the idea of life promotion like I, this is maybe an embarrassing admission but i feel like no, not at all <laughs> like when i when i made fire song partly i felt mm -hmm. like um i felt like a little bit of an imposter because mm -hmm. it felt like um you know i was i was making this film that has this this issue of suicide at the core and i felt like i should really be able to tell people that um that that was part of my life and then, mm -hmm. and then it was, and that it was over, you know. And like, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a grown up now. I fixed it, uh, wh whatever that is. And I have like this, yeah. you know, overwhelmingly positive message to to give out to people. But um, I really didn't. I really didn't feel that way, you know. I, mm -hmm. I really felt like, mm -hmm. and I was afraid of youth coming to me with with questions about about why. Um, why it's worth it, you know, why, why life is worth it, you know, in, in those, in those terms of, of, of really struggling. And I was afraid of not having an answer to that and feeling yeah. like I really needed to have one. Um, mm -hmm. And just on, on the, the previous question of, of life promotion, I just wanted to say that like, it's, it's so hard sometimes to know what your gifts are. It's so hard sometimes to know, like, right now today what you have to contribute but um one of the things that for me has been really important that's that's really kept 
me going day after day is like if you can't if you can't fight for yourself then you can maybe you can find some energy to fight for somebody else maybe you know if you if you don't know what your gifts that you can offer are today maybe you can help a friend that's sick you know if you can't speak maybe you can listen um if you can't take care of anybody else maybe you can you know make some good food for yourself and and like watch a stupid movie and 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 just like give yourself a little bit of a little bit of time and invest in yourself and know that you will that you're if you're even if 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 you're doing that that those small small things to just get through today you're investing for yourself to to be able to fight for yourself another day to fight for for um the people around you another day and and you'll have that energy later on to 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 do the things that you want to do and you'll get that clarity eventually to about the gifts that you have and the change that you want to make and even if you never find out that answer what are the gifts that i have in this world and every single day you do something to take care of yourself and to take care of the people around you that that that's a good life you know um and i know that that's maybe not the most the most satisfying answer but um for for me i really felt like i wanted to live this this life of being an artist and i had my own kind of creative drive at the center of who i who i was and who i wanted to be and i mm-hmm. and i really struggled to pursue that um and it was and at a certain point i found that really difficult and i wasn't really able to continue and that, and that was a really hard thing for me but going back to teachings that i had about um really listening to to the people around me and understanding that we all move through different phases in our life and there's a time of life to be a child there's a time of life to be an uncle there's a time of life to be a parent and a grandparent you know they're all that really helped to give me the strength to um uh, I'm losing my words a little bit, but it just, it just it gave me the strength to, to know that even if I didn't feel like I had a strong direction um, by, by investing in, in the people around me and lifting up the people around me, um, I would be able to find, find my way. And, and ultimately that has been so worth it. It has been the best, the best way to be and the best way to, to live um, that I found. So that's, that's what I wanted to say about that. So much. <clears throat> um, I'm sure a lot of us can resonate with what you have said, and uh, it's so appreciated. So thank you, Adam, very, very, very much. Um, so uh, a question we had was, uh, and I'm going to open this to um, Chelsea. Uh, what can people do if they feel like someone they need to, uh, if someone they know who needs help? But before you answer, Chelsea, I want to make one thing very clear, very quick. Um, if you are seeing this on Facebook, there is a function where you can request for that person to um, receive some support. And it's so if someone's making a status, it's on the top right corner um it's usually a couple of dots or a dot or however it looks for you and uh you can request for that person to to receive some resources and from what i believe it is anonymous and it's a wonderful act of love but moving forward from that now chelsea what can someone do if uh you know someone who needs some help or if you see someone like whether it's social media um, or other places like what can somebody do yeah that's a really important question and i think i mean it can be a complex one um but i think one thing to think about is what is within your limits what is the situation in general so you can keep yourself safe and keep this person safe 
So I think that, you know, as we enter into this situation, thinking about doing a quick check-in with ourselves, how am I doing? What can I offer into this space? Um, to make sure that, you know, if you go into that space and you're going to offer support, that you're able to do so because it can be a little jarring if we go to offer all of the support and then you realize it's actually way too much for us and you have to retract that weight right away. That could actually be a little bit, you know, damaging to that person that we're trying to support. So doing a really quick check-in, where am I at, at right now and what am I able to do? Because maybe if we're not feeling in a good place ourselves, what we can do is help connect that person to a, a separate support where they could actually, you know, get that support from somebody else. So whether that is, you know, checking in with that person and saying, do you have someone that you can talk to? I don't know if I can be that person right now, but I would love to help you think about somebody that you could talk to to help you get through this. Another thing that you can do is if you're able to sit and talk to that person, a lot of the times a person just wants to be heard and being a, be able to talk about what they're going through. So sitting and listening and affirming what that person is going through can be really helpful. There's actually a lot of tools online in order to support people through this. Jack.org has a website called bethere.com where you can actually go through and watch videos that help you think about how you can be there for a friend who is in need. So that might be something that people might want to take a look at to explore this topic a little bit further. Um, and actually co-founder of We Matter, Chen Chai, um, is featured on that page talking about some really awesome topics. So just, you know, a little shameless plug to check it out. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I think being able to um, think about what are the resources within community and a big way to approach it um, that I often like to talk about is not jumping to giving too many suggestions, too much advice and throwing in our own opinions, but allowing the person to direct the conversation because more often that, than not, that person knows what they need. As I mentioned, usually it's just needing to talk and, you know, have a little bit of support and be heard. Sometimes it is a little bit more than that, but just asking open-ended questions so that people can, you know, respond. So being like, how are you feeling? Then they can talk. What do you need right now? Do you know what you need right now? Um, would you like to talk about support that might be able to help you? Um, and then being able to talk about some resources if they want that um, and having some in your back pocket. We will share some slides at the end of this, um, of this panel um, that will talk about a couple of hotlines that people can talk to call and talk to trained professionals. Um, and there's also like on the We Matter website, there's a, excuse me, a get help page where people can um, go and look up resources for their specific region as well. So, you know, there's, I know that's a lot thrown in there. There's lots of things you can do, but I think the main thing is checking in. So checking in with your own personal boundaries first so that you don't jump into support to the rescue and retract really quickly. And then being able to assess the safety so you know that it will be a safe environment for them and for you. And then, you know, having open conversation and being able to link them with supports. You don't have to solve the entire world and figure out, the, you know, you know, fix everything. That's totally okay. Sometimes just, you know, getting them connected to a person that can support them, no matter what the different issue is or what the topic is, that is really helpful. And that can sometimes be the most important thing for a person. Um, so yeah, check out those extra resources because those can help you like delve into this topic a little bit further too. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, <clears throat> that was really helpful. So we're going to move into our second question, which is for Scott. So uh, you had said it was hard for you to identify gifts about yourself. What do you think uh, we can do to help Indigenous youth see the gifts they hold and can offer the world? Um, well, I think just by 
existing with we matter and all the resources that we already provide is um, a great start you know and just um, having these conversations where you know people like myself and like everyone else here can um, express themselves and you know feel like they're heard and feel like they're represented and feel like they're not alone you know because there are a lot of uh, indigenous youth and queer two-spirit youth who are going through similar situations that this movie really um, shows and really brings awareness to and um, I've always um, I think just by providing the space is really important and you know allowing us to speak <laughs> for sure thank you so much <clears throat> okay so in terms of time have time for one more question thank you so much for speaking with us this evening it's been absolutely amazing mm -hmm. um, so there's one question here uh, that is, I think my question is really just looking for some advice on how I, as a non-Indigenous person, mm -hmm. can be a valuable ally. Ooh, that is a good question. Who of our panel would like to take this question? I am hoping, actually, you know what? I'm going to take the liberty. <laughs> Mama Albert. May you take this question, please? Yeah, I think, in ter and, and you know, um, you know, we don't live in silos. As an Indigenous people, we live in the world. And like I said, you know, some of us will live in Toronto or be in New York and be on television or be in movies or be, you know, directors or lawyers. And so really that is around, um, and it's called about ethical space, right? Is understanding for indigenous people, our history is unique. Like we were on this continent for tens of thousands of years. So we have something to contribute to the larger narrative of, you know, living on this land, right? That we call Canada. And, and that's really that, that ability to give space to us, to let us share that, that information uh, as an ally. And, and to understand, especially for two-spirit people, we have a history that predates the larger LGBT movement and colonization. And those are things where we are entrenched in our history, we are entrenched in our culture. So when you talk about decolonization and reconciliation, that includes our experiences to spirit people. And so as an ally, you know, it's just not understanding the TRC calls or the MMIWG calls for action, that it's also understanding, you know, that for two spirit people, we have a particular experience and perspective that needs to be understood and shared, right? And so like, uh, to me, you know, my life is exciting. It's creative and, and uh, you know, it's, it is supported by culture. Uh, and to me, it should always be that way. You know, I was at the International Two-Spirit Gathering uh, two weeks ago in uh, Northern Alberta and it was like four days of being in, uh, you know, two spirit world. <laughs> and, and the reality is it should be like that every day. And that's a goal, right? And the allies can help us. And, you know, to get to where we are, uh, there have been allies along the way that have worked with us. And I just want to say in our 2008 two spirit gathering, we got a letter of support from um, uh, a politician from the U.S. named uh, uh, Obama. <laughs> And that was before he became the president that he committed to supporting uh, two-spirit people in, uh, in North America, right? So, so that to me is an ally, right? When, when someone does uh, send us the letter of support for our two-spirit gathering there. Thank you so much. You know, Obama sounds familiar to me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Away in the skin of Mel. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. That's really appreciated. <clears throat> so this has been um, an amazing discussion with uh, of such important topics that uh, folks within our communities, within our spaces may shy away from. So I, uh, I honor um, you folks who have taken the, have uh, taken the time and have committed to being bold for uh, talking about this, uh, these important topics. So thank you to all for sharing your wisdom and uh, your experiences with us. <clears throat> before we close our time together, before we leave this space, I want to thank Terrence Thomas for being with us to ensure uh, safety and support for the event. Um, I also want to thank our elder, Albert McLeod, for being with us and sharing their knowledge. Uh, thank you to We Matter and It Gets Better. It, it, oh, hi. <laughs> it Gets Better Canada for coming together to host the event. Uh, thank you to the film producer, Big Soul Production and distributor, Vape for providing fire song uh, in support for the event. And we cannot forget Adam. Adam, <laughs> thank you so much. It means more for a lot of us than you'll ever know. Oh my goodness, that film, incredible and so moving. So we honor you today for that beautiful, amazing film. Um, and as you uh, can see on the screen, here are some resources that you can access if you need. And we'd like to thank Tara McDonald and her team for taking care of all the technical and all the logistics. Um, I'm not great at that stuff. So if we can all give a huge, 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 huge thanks for that, that would be wonderful because this would not have happened without that. So thank you so, 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 so much, Tara and your whole team. Incredible, 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 incredible. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome. It's been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. I love it. Okay, so on screen, you can see the First Nations and Inuit Hope for Wellness Helpline. You can see Kids Help Phone. Um, and then you also see the We Matter logo. Visit us at We Matter. Oh, wait, just got, hold on, my thing is in front of it. Can't see, I can't give you incorrect information. Here we go. So visit wematercampaign.org uh, slash get hyphen help. And you can access some wonderful resources. Um, and of course, thank you to our audience and everybody who tuned in and sharing this space with us. We are so grateful um, to be able to share these important conversations with passionate people like yourselves. Um, and without further ado, we would like to wish you a good evening and thank you so much for sharing this time with us. So feel free to log out of the call with the warmest thank you. <laughs>